Thank you, Ken. Just picking up on a few bits on what Ken said, um, the litigation assessment strategy in the UK, um, if taxpayers don't feel they're being um, um, dealt with correctly, they can make a complaint, but they can make a complaint to HMRC, they just mark their own homework. Um, the interest rate point he made about the difference between tax owed and tax paid, we have that in the UK. Um, um, there's a particular case I'm working on where the difference um, is about £250,000. Um, and we call behind the scenes, we call that the interest rate bucket. Um, and if you want to try and offset the, the, the interest correctly, you can spend years going to the interest rate review board. It's just silly. It's just, it, that could be a very simple thing to put to legislation. Um, I would agree that um, um, couching this idea and the idea of policing um, makes sense. It's similar to what we've seen in previous years prior to the Crown Prosecution um, Service coming into place. There was that TV program, I can't remember the name offhand. Right, okay. So um, my expertise um, in tax matters goes back over two decades and it's around deemed employment and this whole IR35 and our payroll legislation, uh, which affects all self-employed people. You folks know this very well. Now, the reason I talk about this today is because IR35 is a problem where, where the tax law has um, vast complexity, the subjectivity. Um, so IR35 relies on the need for all of these firms now, their payroll legislation to make these status assessments. And I sometimes say that's like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube with a blindfold on. Um, it's extremely difficult. There's not many of us that know how to do it. And you need to know 200 years of case law to be able to do it really well. Um, so assessing the status is ridiculously complex. So there's other areas that are complex, for example, VAT and so on. There's other areas that are similar, have similar complexity. And my observation and what I'm saying is where there is complexity, this is where the unfairness can breed. And where, where we, and I'll come on to that in a little while, but how, how do we end up with this complex, horrible tax legislation like IR35 on the statute? Well, um, HMRC runs these consultations where all of these stakeholders are engaged and apparently to help HMRC understand more about the best solutions to the problem. Um, these days, I would say, um, based on years of responding from these consultations, they're a bit of a waste of time. Um, I'd say they are designed as tick box exercises. They're used to identify holes to be plugged um, in a preordained decision that's already going to be made and what's going to happen anyway. So the, the people who could really actually help if a more considered view was taken, we will kind of step back and we can't be bothered to really engage with these consultations. So you then end up with a badly informed HMRC because the people who could help can't be bothered anymore because they don't know what they listen to. And then you end up with badly informed decisions leading to badly drafted legislation. And this poor process infects everything and even infects the impact statements that Parliament then get to see. Um, and then Parliament weighs through the legislation, trusting the Treasury and HMRC to be doing the right thing. Because, I mean, these, these are really complex pieces of tax legislation. You can't expect MPs to read them. A lot of us find them very difficult ourselves, and we're in the business. So, and all, and all of this complexity has consequences. So, this committee is aware of the loan charge impact statement um, and how the actual impact varies considerably to what Parliament was originally told. Now, the off payroll tax, IR35 reforms, they estimated that the administrative cost to business, um, that was in the impact report. But an HMRC commissioned report only three months ago informed us that the costs to business were 74 times more than what was said in the original impact statement. Okay. Now, HMRC allowed off payroll to be released with all these with no structural flaws in the legislation. And there is an absolute clangor in this at the moment. Um, and they've known about this for five years. It was picked up by the National Audit Office, the Public Accounts Committee, and the Lords. Um, we also have also brought attention to its department. Um, and this is that there's a double taxation flaw in the legislation. So when under the new rules, when HMRC investigates a business and issues a tax bill, because of this double taxation flaw, the bill, the tax bill they get is four times what it should be. Okay. Now I know of one firm right now sat on a tax bill of 60 million pounds. It's one of them, it's a broadcaster. It should be 50 million. Um, 
So the behavioural effect of that's happened that they're now trying to push lots of their self-employed people onto, into, uh, I guess, false employment on payroll. And they're saying no. And then TV shows are starting to get cancelled. This is the kind of thing, things that are happening. And because firms are scared, because they might end up this massive tax bill that they shouldn't really owe because of all this complexity. So it's, it's, it's really no surprise that under the new rules, firms have banned the use of genuine contractors. It's no surprise because of the behaviour effect. And it's no surprise that firms are then, because they don't want to have workers as employees, are pushing them through agencies into these unregulated umbrella companies, which brings us right back to, you know, payroll fraud and all those kinds of issues that have been battled for years. I mean, I've, I've worked with HMRC fraud investigations, I've tried working with Cirrus all, all us for years and now some of these people. And it's very difficult because um, burden of proof is very high in fraud and everyone's run off with the money, uh, you know, four years later. And it's the individuals that turn out to be the victims. Under off payroll, it's going to be the businesses that are going to be the victims this time. Um, and HMRC go around trying to then enforce the IR35 legislation on these new businesses. Now, um, so moving on to those inquiries, this is what Ken touched on, the inquiry process. This is where I've seen unfairness um, for many, many years and unfair treatment of some taxpayers. And what do I mean by unfair? I mean that a taxpayer is given a tax bill, an IR35 opinion, by HMRC, you owe us this much money, and it's clearly wrong. It's clearly wrong. But the taxpayer then has to spend years under the cosh without the financial firepower to try and defend themselves. And in many cases, the cost to defend the position, particularly in an IR35 case, is more than the tax at stake. I've had lots of calls with people in the, in the media sector and said to them, oh, you don't have tax investigation insurance. OK, you owe 20,000. It costs you 100,000. Sorry, I can't help you. Pay the money. And yes, there's no way you should be caught. Plenty of those conversations. So that's, that's the pay the tax bill by intimidation rather than seeking the truth. Um, um, so, so that's not fair. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not going to say that these wrong opinions are arrived at due to malpractice, corruption, abuse of power. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the door is absolutely wide open for it. Okay? But I think on the whole, mistakes are normally made because HMRC is facing an impossible task. Now, this, they must be seen to apply the tax law consistently and fairly to everybody the same. Well, how do you how do you apply a piece of very complex tax legislation consistently? The only way you can get consistency is you need a sausage machine like process. And you can't create a simple process unless you narrow down the complexity and create a process that isn't actually ended up aligned with the law in terms of the case law prior 35. It can't be done. Can't do it. Um, but there is a narrowed down process, and I've seen it applied over the years to all of the people in particularly the media sector now. Um, and that's why you end up with mistakes and plenty of them. And that's why we're seeing more than half of the people that go to a tax tribunal win their appeals. Um, to shine a light on that claim, um, since 2010, um, when the general and special commissioners were replaced, HMRC has lost 70% of those hearings. Um, so and they were told that actually by in the course of doing that so how's that they attempted to narrow down the law and they were wrong about that um, and this is what's been led to the unfairness and, and people being wrongly classified again i'm talking about ir35 but this this concept applies across the board um so um the, the in ir35 world with these with this bizarre nonsense of a deemed um, employee an hmrc inspector could look at any engagement and they could create reasons why that person's caught my R35. It's easy. I could do it. I could create reason for inside or outside. I mean, I help people when they're not supposed to be caught. I mean, if they are caught, I tell them. But yeah, an HMRC inspector could absolutely tick all the boxes, find out the reasons, go and search just for the reasons they need and say, there you go, you owe us the money. So they could totally do that. And they had the power to write these life-changing opinion letters, essentially almost on a whim which results in years of expensive and unaffordable pain for the taxpayer. 
And the pressure on the taxpayer is, hey, you pay up or you're going to tax tribunal, which you can't afford, by the way. Um, and as the saying goes, uh, Sir James Matthews, in England, justice is open to all, just like the Red State Hell. I don't know if you heard that one. Um, so even if you go to FT, if, even if you go to tribunal and you win, HMRC, because of the subjectivity of about 35 and the struggle judges have, they'll always find a way to appeal and you're back in. You know, for example, the case with Kay Adams that's gone first tier, upper tier, Court of Appeal is now going back to the first tier. And she spent far much more money trying to defend herself than the tax at stake, probably by about tenfold, I would say, by now. Um, so it's bailed in the life territory. So some of the things that I've seen, um, a case not yet at tribunal, costs were already £300,000. Um, I've seen taxpayers who are suffering um, uh, mental anguish, anxiety, being on antidepressants for years. I've seen opinion letters issued for three different people. Two of them are extremely high profile, well known people um, that have different fact patterns. They work in different areas, but the letters are exactly the same, except they've changed the names of the personal service companies. Now, cutting and pasting one person's tax bill onto another in the opinion letter, I don't think that's a mistake. OK, I don't think that's a mistake. There's no, there's no excuse for that. Um, I've I see, uh, I know about fact finding meetings where HMRC always write the notes from that meeting. And I would say, to put it politely, there is a major problem with unconscious bias when those notes are often written. Um, and, the, and the struggle that a taxpayer has when they go to a tax tribunal is they have to discharge the burden of proof. They're guilty until they can prove otherwise. But when they, when they go to a tribunal, HMRC rarely puts up any of their own witnesses in tribunal at all. And those notes that they write, having met other people to try and solicit evidence, in law is considered true and accurate unless it can be proved otherwise. Well, if they don't put up the witnesses and they're not cross-examined, how can anyone really win? Right. So it's hard to prove what someone's written down might not be true or or might have been misconstrued if you can't call on the witnesses and cross-examine them. Consider it the other way around, you're the taxpayer. I mean, the case we fought in 2019, um, that poor chap, he was under cross-examination for eight hours. He successfully appealed, but he was asked questions for eight hours. So, you, I mean, in IR35, you're, um, you're sort of four years down the line and you, you're given one of these opinion letters and you have to try and prove otherwise. You can't get hold of the people, people have moved on, people don't want to go to court. You're in a handicapped race. Um, it's very, very difficult to discharge a burden of proof in these types of cases. And that whole imbalance of power um, seems to me to be, to be very unfair. Um, so just wrapping up, um, HMRC has more powers than the police. They can issue tax bills based on their own internal guidelines, which they might not even um, align with the law. They can write notes of meetings without the taxpayer even being present, and they're considered true in court, and they don't have to call witnesses. Um, they can choose what information they look for during their inquiries, and they are not obligated to speak to anyone the taxpayer suggests may hold account of you. Um, that's often happened where people have said, why don't you go and speak to this person, give them a list. No, they don't, they just ignore that. Um, so mistakes can occur, um, a consequence of an overly simplified process. It leads to tax bills being issued where access to justice is almost impossible because no one can afford the witness. Um, and the lack of accountability around this process, the inquiry process, means any inspector who chooses to abuse their power can do so and there's little reach to stop them. There's just a lack of accountability around this inquiry process and it leaves the door wide open for mistakes, for mistakes to be made. So what needs to happen um, is, first of all, I think we need to recognise that there is a problem, and then we need to look at the various solutions available, and that's that's one that, that this pen has, has presented. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much um, for polishing questions. We'll ask you about that, uh, or Cap Jason, uh, really. So can yeah. we hear from them for 